I'd like to welcome you to this week's Haven Center lectures. There will be uh, two lectures today and uh, tomorrow on Global War and the New Imperialism, although I guess I don't know if the, the titles have remained the same or gotten tweaked, but it doesn't matter. Too. These are two linked lectures. Uh, the, the usual routine for Haven Center visits is a two lectures and then a Thursday seminar <coughs> That's just an open discussion without it uh, involving an additional presentation, in which the two lectures are the point of departure rather than the constraints on the topics of that open discussion. Uh, this week it will be an hour later than usual because Adam will be doing a WRT interview at noon. So 1.15 rather than the usual 12.15 time period on Thursday in uh, room 8108 Social Science. Uh, Adam Morton is a Professor of Political Economy in the Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney. The Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney is really, a, if not unique, one of a very small number of such programs <coughs> anywhere. Uh, it emerged out of conflicts within economics in, uh, in which Frank Stillwell uh, was a kind of leading architect of trying to stabilize a program for heterodox political economic studies. And the issue was whether it should be located inside of economics as a thorn in the side of the mainstream, or really should be a standalone program of its own, which could still be, of course, in dialogue and perhaps opposition to the mainstream. And the decision was to institutionalize it as a separate program. And given the subsequent history of economics and its tendency to obliterate everything <clears throat> other than its central uh, doctrines, I think uh, that was undoubtedly a wise decision. Uh, Adam joined the department five years ago now? 2014, yeah. yeah. Not quite five years ago. Uh, from England and is now one of the core members of this, uh, of this departmental project. I would uh, encourage you to look at the website of the program in political economy at the University of Sydney. They have a fantastic blog which recently got some big award for being the best political economy blog in the world or something. <laughs> something, <laughs> something like that. Like something like that. That's a first approximation. <laughs> yeah. and of course, if it's the best political economy blog in the world, it actually makes it the best, certainly the best political economy blog in the galaxy, <laughs> perhaps even the universe as far as we know. Uh, at least we can make that claim. Uh, <clears throat> Adam's uh, own research has centered on Mexico, particularly on the Mexican Revolution. He wrote a wonderful book on revolution and the state in modern Mexico, which I recommend to you, uh, and is also author of Unraveling Gramsci, Hegemony, or Hegemony, as the Brits would, and Aussies would say. <laughs> Hegemony and the Passive Revolution in the Global, in global, political, econ in the global political Economy. Uh, Gramsci is certainly a sufficiently difficult theorist that unraveling him, I hope you re-ravel him too. I so, did, yeah. yeah so, Didn't leave him disassembled. So, right, so, <laughs> <laughs> is also part of, the, of that project. Uh, he, today and on Thursday, he'll be talking about themes from his forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press. And he describes what he's doing as workshopping the book. I don't know if that implies that there's still room for tweaking if so. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so there's still room for tweaking if some, you know, incisive comments and dialogue around core themes emerges from the three days of his visit. But in any case, we'll hear what you have to say. And thanks so much. Oh, uh, okay, yes, I did mention the, the seminar, so that's all. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for coming, folks, and um, just want to start off by thanking uh, Patrick Barrett and Matthew Ritter for organising all the particulars that have got me here today and made it possible to speak in front of you. And also a special thank you uh, to Eric as well for inviting me. I can remember the exact spot where we were sat having a coffee when he said, you know, what about um, I propose you as a Haven Centre uh, visiting a fellow, and it's one of those moments I was extremely delighted at the thought and for it to come to fruition, so many thanks Eric. What I want to talk about today is, is a joint book, so I don't know how many Haven Centre fellows have visited and come to talk about something jointly when their co-author unfortunately is, isn't present for all sorts of reasons. 
Um, it's a book that we've been working on, uh, Andreas Bieler and myself, for quite some time. Uh, we were uh, colleagues together at the University of Nottingham. Andreas um, organises and directs another of these islands of heterodoxy. I think the Haven Centre is one. I think the Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney is another. And certainly the centre that Andreas directs, the Centre for the Study of Social and Global Justice at Nottingham, is another. And I think at some stage we should have a conversation about how to further kind of connect these, these institutions. But that's for another day. So Andreas and I, we were colleagues at Nottingham for eight, eight years. We've had a, an ongoing collaborative dimension to our research that so we publish on our own. But we also have this, I think, a very, very special, highly enjoyable, very comradely close relationship writing together. And perhaps to our shame, this has now been a friendship for over 20 years and a writing collaboration for nearly as long, something like 18 years. And my plea, how many graduate students have we got in the, in the room? My plea to graduate students, so about 50%, is that this platform that I'm talking about today is really a case uh, for the defense of uh, though going for coffee with your fellow graduate students and it being substantively and actively a research process as well. So you're not wasting time away from the desk and away from the PhD conversations that Andreas and I had as graduate students together uh, at our first convention have led to, to where we're at with this uh, book uh, today. So highly, highly productive. And there were a few beers as well uh, occasionally in between. Um, so it's a joint book project. Um, Eric saw me, uh, we had dinner on Sunday evening and I, I was sweating on the decision uh, from Cambridge University Press. They had their syndicate meeting on Friday in, in the UK and so I knew that the decision was going to land probably before today and I'd be either really happy or just thoroughly miserable. Thankfully it was really happy that the contract came through actually on, on Monday so it's contracted with Cambridge University Press. The book is entitled Global Capitalism, a Global War, Global Crisis and it should be out in uh, 2018. Uh, in terms of those islands of heter heterodoxy, Eric has already mentioned the blog Progress in Political Economy. It didn't quite win the best um, political Economy Blog in the World Prize. It was a, a best blog prize organised through the International Studies Association. But it is something that we've been actively trying to uh, promote as a as appointment reading, something that you can read on the bus, on the commute, maybe not when you're driving, but over a coffee in the morning uh, or in the evening if you're a night owl. And indeed, we've had um, Eric um, very much prominent on the blog when he gave the Wheelwright Lecture. Uh, just over a year ago, which was hugely popular in terms of numbers on the evening and, and the hits afterwards with the recording of the lecture. So I just wanted to give a, a, a plug for that. It's at ppesydney.net. Uh, okay, so global war, sorry, global capitalism, global war, global crisis in that order. I, I will be talking today predominantly in, in giving an overview of the whole book and certain slices of it. And then tomorrow with the focus on the new imperialism going into detail in, in one particular chapter. But the structure for today is therefore to just to outline the purpose of the book as a whole, give you a skeletal structure actually on the next slide of the chapter by chapter organisation. And I want to get into perhaps the, the focus of today's uh, talk a little bit more detail as to what I mean and we mean by the hallmark uh, of historical materialism and its necessary moment uh, within um, political economy and political science. And part of that necessity of uh, ensuring the continued lived experience of historical materialism within the academy, but also within activism, is to assert the centrality of, of class struggle. This has been a constant in both our individual researches, mine and Andreas's. Uh, he looks at uh, European uh, Union, uh, trade union organizing and restructuring um, in and through neoliberalism. I focus on Mexico. So class has been a constant theme in both our researches and this book uh, will, will enforce that centrality of, of a focus on class agency as well. And then coming out of the overview of the overall book and its main claims, I've got two foci, if you like, on different chapters of the book. And I'll get to the structure of the, of the whole text in a moment. But I'll give you a short overview of the focus on global capitalism, which we have in one particular chapter 
and um, its attention to rising powers, and here we look at China uh, within the so-called BRICS. And then I'll also give a slice through the chapter on global war and the new imperialism to really set things up for, for tomorrow's discussion. And in this chapter, again, engaging contemporary but also classical arguments about imperialism, we look at the, the war in Iraq. So this is the structure of today's presentation. This is the structure, and then I'll conclude. This is the, oh, sorry, the structure of the book's just to, just to come. Let me give you a quick overview of these three elements. So global capitalism, global war, global crisis is the name, is the name of the book. And what we want to argue here is that there is a, an important rejuvenation of debates about uneven and combined development, uh, particularly within international relations which um, we both speak to coming out of political economy from uh, political science, um, but also more broadly uh, through geographical studies, if you think about the work of Neil Smith, um, through development studies. So one of the key features uh, of, again, both our work, but certainly this book, is uh, a detailed engagement, again, with the classical and the contemporary debates about uneven and, and combined development. Uh, a, a concept, a theory that obviously has uh, all sorts of re resonances a hundred years on from the Russian Revolution this month. So we have a focus on these historical and contemporary themes throughout the book uh, through relevant chapters on uneven and combined development in relation to global capitalism and its expansion. Uh, global war, we're interested in the internal relationship uh, between geopolitics and capitalism manifested specifically within uh, the war in Iraq, which empirically we look at. And then in terms of global crisis, we have an additional chapter uh, looking at the Eurozone crisis, uh, the debt restructuring in Greece. So empirically, this is where the book will end up at in the last three chapters. Uh, global capitalism, global war, global crisis, looking at the rise of the BRICS and the expansion of capitalism in relation to China, the Iraq war and debates on a new imperialism and um, the Eurozone crisis and struggles against austerity. We look at the uh, relationship between these three um, dimensions from a historical materialist and Marxist perspective. Uh, and these three conditions, um, and I'll get a little bit into Bertel Ullmann's work in a moment, he would call them vantage points. These three vantage points give us a way of conceiving the internal relationship of these three dimensions. So we think historical materialism, maybe not uniquely, but certainly um, very effectively, asserts this dialectical relational analysis, and this is what we want to promote in analyzing these three dimensions. And we do so not in a way that enforces an additive focus. So it's, you'll notice in the title of the book, it's not global capitalism, global war, and global crisis. We're conceiving of them in, in their internal relationship as, um, as always already uh, related internally, and I'll explain more on that shortly. So this is the actual structure of the book that I um, slightly ran away with in terms of my, my thinking. Uh, the introduction, elements of which I'll draw on today in terms of the philosophy of internal relations drawn from Bertel Ullmann, but other people as well, like uh, Derek Sayer. This leads us into a set of, if you like, meta-theoretical considerations about structure and agency. Um, ontologically, how do we understand uh, uneven and combined development? What is the role of class agency and class struggle within that? So really, in the first part of the book, we set up these meta-theoretical uh, arguments. And this also then, uh, in, the, in the third chapter, uh, entails us engaging with debates about the so-called relationship between the ideal on the one hand and the material on the other. <clears throat> and again, I'll explain this in, in some detail in a moment, but quite commonly within political science, these are always already separate elements. You'll have a material dimension, quite often in arguments such as uh, the neo-realist approaches to international relations, where they just look at the material capabilities of states separate from any any discursive, um, constitutive role for ideas. Equally, a constructivist would look at the essential relations revolving around the ideational. And here we draw on Gramsci uh, in particular to assert what he actually called the material structure of ideology. So that's not our term, that's a quote, unquote, reference to Gramsci in one particular note, and I'll unpack that a little bit more in, in today's discussion. 
Then we get into some of the main ideas uh, that we've been working on in relation to uneven and combined development. So how, how does one understand the historical constitution of uneven and combined development within the origins of capitalism, which is chapter four? Here in particular, engaging with the social property relations uh, approach or perspective with people like Robert Brenner, Ellen Wood. How, how do we understand the contemporary expansion of capitalism and its restructuring? in relation to the geopolitics of today is what we address in chapter five. And the chapter that we're working on at the moment, I'll get into where we're actually at with the manuscript as well shortly, uh, issues of class struggle and how we focus, not simply on class struggles within the workplace, but an expanded notion of class struggle that also engages issues of reproduction in the biosphere as well. And then this gets us hopefully to the empirical chapters, global capitalism, global war, global crisis, China and the BRICS, uh, Iraq and um, the Eurozone crisis and debt restructuring with a final concluding chapter which we intend to be a substantive chapter actually on um, on resistance. So where are we at with the book? Um, essentially we've got um, just one chapter to write from scratch uh, which is uh, unusually maybe in finishing a manuscript is actually in this case the last chapter. It doesn't always work out that way. Um, we've, we've completed in really polished forms the first five chapters, uh, including the introduction, which again is a bit unusual, I think, that sometimes gets left till last. Um, and we have uh, advanced drafts of chapters uh, seven, uh, eight, uh, and nine, uh, an almost advanced chapter of chapter four finished, and it's really chapter six that we've got um, something to, to go on, uh, chapter ten to completely start from scratch. So we're hoping that we'll have the book done by um, by the beginning of August uh, this year. That's the deadline anyway we set ourselves, which we shall see. So I'll come back to this at the end of the presentation if people have questions about the structure of the book. So what do I mean by the hallmark of historical materialism and, and this necessarily historical uh, materialist moment? Well, we argue uh, in the book, and I've been teaching uh, honours classes that the, um, the hallmark of historical materialism, in, in our view, is, the, is, is a dialectical approach. It's a dialectical approach. And this comes through um, in engagement with uh, Bertel Ullman's uh, uh, book, Alienation, and more contemporary writings of his. There was a very good special issue of the journal Capital and Class that came out a year or so ago with uh, other essays uh, by people such as David McMally. Now, it's important to, to realise that, obviously, that philosophy of internal relations is not unique to Marxism or historical materialism. So, um, as Bertel Ullman references, you know, you can find, obviously, the dialectic uh, embedded in he Hegelian uh, thinking, the work of Spinoza, Leibniz, uh, critical realism and Bashka. But we, we do think that historical materialism offers something substantive in terms of its dialectical approach, uh, and we think there is a rejuvenation now underway of these sorts of discussions. So we read uh, at Sydney in one of the reading groups that I convened, um, Jason Moore's Capitalism in the Web of Life, which is firmly embedded in this argument about uh, internal relations uh, and trying to understand um, capitalism uh, and ecology uh, in their internal relationship. But it's really in Bertel Ullman's book, In Alienation, that we get this emphasis on the character of capital as a, as a social relation through his reading of Marx, <laughs> uh, bless you, um, and how he understands relations as internal uh, to each other. So this means rather than positing factors as logically independent of one another, existing side by side or additive, the method focuses on the internally related <laughs> aspects of particular vantage points within a self-forming uh, whole. So what Bertel Ullman is particularly interested in uh, is this focus on a philosophy of internal relations, as he calls it. And to give you a quote from, from Alienation, he argues that with the philosophy of internal relations, the problem is never how to relate separate entities, but how to disentangle a relational group of relations from the total and necessary configuration in which they exist. So he's not against abstractions. We all work with abstractions. But uh, ontologically, he wants to have this relational approach to the abstractions within which he, he works. 
So it's the hallmark of historical materialism, we argue, the philosophy of internal relations makes explicit a conception of capital, where connections are main maintained as aspects of the self-forming whole. And one of the luxuries of study leave, which I'm on at the moment, means that I've just managed to complete a rereading of, of capital. Um, a rereading or a complete uh, reconstruction of my notes, I'm not sure. So the notes ended up being 29,500 words over 70 pages. Um, so it's a kind of a detailed reading or, or, or fresh. And obviously what comes out of that is uh, Marx's emphasis uh, on his dialectical approach to uh, understanding capital and labour and various other concepts. And um, famously, Vilfredo uh, Pareto said that when one reads Marx, words appear like bats. You can see in them uh, both uh, birds and mice. And he saw that as a negative. Uh, what Bert Lollman famously elevates with that quotation is the positive, is the relational aspect of every concept that Marx is, is dealing with. Now, of course, we see that the, the, the dialectical relation of concepts and the treatment of uh, the dialectical relation, uh, relation of concepts in other work. Uh, a wonderful phrase from Engels in the dialectics of nature is the way in which he wants to focus on the spiral uh, form uh, of development. And so with this sort of emphasis, we're looking at the internal relationship of global capitalism, global war and global crisis, which are held as vantage points, as um, Ullman would call them, so that we can begin to unravel um, the conditions of uneven and combined development, both historically and contemporaneously. Marx himself in the Grundrisse <coughs> captures this um, focus when he says the tendency to create the world market is directly given in the concept of capital itself. Again, you can get this uh, emphasis from other Marxist thinkers, Henri Lefebvre uh, in particular, a thinker that Bertel Ullman actually highlights as somebody that uh, treats um, his concepts through this dialectical uh, internal relational perspective, says the result of the lived against abstractions of the everyday against the economism of the social and civil society against the high rate of growth whose demands are held by the state. This is what um, Henri Lefebvre in the production of space especially wants to, wants to move beyond. And this quote from Henri Lefebvre, particularly when looking at the revolt of the lived against abstractions, brings us to Derek Say's book, The Violence of Abstraction, which again he wants to move beyond by focusing on the connection between people's productive relations with nature, which I think is an important emphasis, or labour process, and their productive relations between themselves or the social relations of production, to conceive of that as internal and necessary. And I also think this is an important element, um, not external uh, and continued. And I think this is what Marxism gives us. It, it gives us a theorisation of these internal relations, of treating these concepts as internally related. Now that's the broad kind of overview of some of the contentions that we have in the first introductory chapter to the book. Um, this was something that we toyed with including in the book in that introductory chapter but we decided to excise it for the reason that we didn't want the chapter um, to have this feeling of, of um, critiquing the discipline of political science or international relations, to have a more affirmative, well this is just what our argument is and this is how we're going to roll it out. But I think this nevertheless is a useful heuristic to get to some of the separations that are entailed within mainstream political science thinking. And I was joking earlier with some colleagues, Eric, that I hope you appreciate this table and its, and its typologies because to get this to work on PowerPoint took me longer than all the other slides. And we'll find out why in a moment. Okay, so a simple set of quadrants between uh, content and form. Now, if I click on this, it should work. So, classically, when we think of international relations, um, theory, uh, particularly neo-realist theory, my contention or our contention is that there's a constant separation, a philosophy of external relations, between the treatment of the material and the ideal. Okay. Structural realism or neo-realism famously does this in the way in which it focuses exclusively uh, on states as the primary actors within the international. 
and define states in a very, very delimited uh, way, purely in terms of their, at least in terms of classical and, and uh, classical neorealist thinking, their material capabilities. And so the, those material capabilities are separated, as I alluded to earlier, from any notions of ideation or constitutional or, or constructivism. So what we have here in terms of um, this relationship between content and form is a primarily material uh, analysis, the content uh, of the content uh, as we frame it here. And uh, we've purloined this, um, this approach actually from Frederick Jameson's um, Modernism papers where he talks about these issues. At the opposite end of the spectrum, um, ideas all the way down, constructivism within, within international relations primarily emphasizes the form of the content. So it's the constitutive role of ideas that play the key emphasis here, uh, valorizing the ideational um, almost as a form of philosophical idealism and the social construction of, of ideas, divorced from any uh, necessary forms and divorced from uh, material circumstances uh, or constraints. At the radical end, but nevertheless for us, still focusing on the form of the form, is post-structuralism. Post-structuralism doesn't deny that there is a material world out there, but what it does assert is that that material world can only be understood through discourse. So it's a different uh, ontological and then epistemological position. So we craft this as the form of the form, as the most radical subjectivist uh, position, which for us still emphasizes too much the contingency of discourse separate from, from material conditions. And of course the uh, chariot riding over the hill to save us uh, from oblivion is the theory that can concentrate on the content of the form. This is the necessarily historical materialist moment we think that Marxism gives us in dialectically looking at the content of form. The content of form. Um, so we've, we've taken this out of the introduction for space constraints, but also for the tenor of the chapter to avoid sort of a heavy critique of, of the discipline, but we think it gets, it gets the message across for presentational purposes. So in contrast to three of those four main theories that don't look at the combination of the material and the ideal in their internal relationship, what we do in those early meta-theoretical chapters is look at issues of agency and structure through the philosophy of internal relations, uh, drawing from Gramsci, um, and in particular, the way in which, which Gramsci uh, looks at the social relations of production as a generator of both structure and agency. And I think this is what Gramsci, Gramsci gives many things to, to us in terms of theoretical tools, but he is a, clearly a theorist of, of agency. And we focus here on the structuring conditions of capitalism, which shape competitiveness, uh, compulsions, as, as Marx called it, both on um, capital and, and labor, the bourgeoisie and the pro proletariat, the crisis tendencies that are inherent within capitalism, and then also <clears throat> uneven and combined development as the outward expansion. And really it's for us that uneven and combined development is a structuring condition. It's a structuring condition, and this is how I crafted it in, in the Mexico book as well, within which are situated those processes of class agency through which state formation is conducted and state identity is constructed. Gramsci famously talked about that through processes of passive revolution, which I'll talk about in a moment a little bit more, and that's how I conceive of it in the Mexico book. So uneven and combined development is a structuring condition and really the class agency of passive revolution through which state identity is constructed is captured through that second concept. And what we argue here is that the material is therefore determining in the first instance, instance through conditions of uneven and combined development. While there are always several different strategies uh, embedded in, in conflict that class agents may choose. So this gives us a, an open an open form of Marxism. This focus on the uh, embeddedness, the internal relationship of the material and the ideal comes also through uh, chapter three as well on the material structure of ideology. 
Now, Gramsci is a convoluted thinker to engage with, sometimes lacks cl clarity. But in my reading of the, the prison notebooks, uh, and we all have our own favourite quotations from various thinkers, this isn't a quotation, but it's just one paragraph where Gramsci's lucidity is startlingly surprising. And he wants to look at the forces of class agency within state and civil society. Again, no separations uh, between the two. Uh, and he wants to do so through the material structure of ideology. This is what he phrases um, as his key emphasis. And he explains very clearly as to what he means by that. He talks about the uh, very organisation of the urban grid, street layouts. The politics of naming those streets within our urban societies. Um, the organisation of ideology uh, within education, within schools. Uh, he mentions the parish newsletter. And he says these are all to be conceived as various different aspects of the material uh, structure of ideology. To enforce us to become more aware of the, the processes of vacancy operating across state and civil society. So what we find in this one paragraph, unusually clear for Gramsci, is this dialectical connect connectedness of ideas and, and material social processes. Ideas are part of a hegemonic structure for Gramsci, transmitted through, for example, specific forms of architecture, which he also mentions in a separate set of notes. Quite often people think of Foucault as the theorist of capillary power, uh, with, it, with that rendering, but it's actually Gramsci that comes through with this uh, focus on capillary processes, he calls it. So hegemony operates within civil society and it's established through a whole range of um, social institutions. And this is Gramsci's famous theory of the integral, the integral state. So state plus civil society. Ideas are not arbitrary. Um, they're historically <laughs> produced in and through conditions of class struggle. Gramsci famously gives us his conception of the organic intellectual as the key agents uh, that are representative of, of those forms uh, of ideas and processes uh, of struggle. And to come back to the constructivist approach within international relations, we, we're struck at, at how people like Martha uh, Finnemore and Catherine Sicking can <coughs> focus on norm entrepreneurs, which is a an ugly term, but it's their term, norm on entrepreneurs that raise ideas, um, for example, about development within the IMF is one of their examples. But they do so without any focus on the social content of those ideas or the, or the critiquing of those ideas. And they do so also with no reference actually to, to Gramsci whatsoever. So these ideas are not embedded within material circumstances. They're free-floating, and this um, is something that somewhat aggravates us as Marxists. Okay, so that sets up the, the first couple of chapters uh, and what starts to come through then is this focus on, on class struggle. We're in, a, in accord broadly with the social property relations approach in relation to the orange, origins of capitalism, notwithstanding um, ongoing critiques of its, of its Eurocentrism, which we share. So we set up really the theory of uneven and combined development in chapter four and its contemporary manifestations uh, within the, the interstate system in chapter five. And again, it's, it's a, a reading of, of Gramsci through, through Palantzas in this case that gives us this extended theory of the state, the integral state, as a condensation of, of class struggle. But importantly, what Palantzas does in the epoch of its unfolding of the 1970s, this gives us an understanding of the internalization of class interests, the class interests within the European Union vis-a-vis -vis American capital in the 1970s that would later be known as globalization or transnational production and finance. So we, we would add Poulantas into the, the canon, if you like, of thinkers that we draw from, along with Ellen Wood, uh, Robert Brenner and others that deal with this internal relations perspective from a Marxist position. <clears throat> okay, so that broadly sets up the, the contours of the book. I want to slice now through um, two, two chapters, one on uh, global capitalism and the rising powers, 
and then hopefully um, also as a prelude to tomorrow's talk on Iraq, uh, issues about um, global, global war and the new imperialism. If we go back to the critique of those mainstream approaches, neorealism has been preoccupied predominantly when it looks at uh, rising powers, particularly China, as a focus on great, great power rivalry. <coughs> Barry Buzan, uh, in particular, <coughs> has been concerned about the, the peaceful rising uh, of China. And this is largely embedded in a state-to-state -state conflict of China vis-a-vis -vis the United States, uh, looking at the, the material, uh, material capabilities of both in a zero-sum conflictual uh, international environment. <clears throat> On the other hand, liberalism looks at China embedded through processes of interdependence and inter integration uh, as a win-win uh, scenario. There are also wider debates that look at state capitalists, which I'll come to in a moment, versus neoliberal policies underpinning the rise of China. But what we argue in this chapter is that the main problem of these discussions is, again, the separation of um, politics and economics, um, the economic and the political, uh, that often collapses into an ahistoric analysis. Alternative Marxist approaches, though, are similarly um, problematic, we feel, in terms of the, some of the separations that we highlight. So Giovanni Arrighi uh, emphasizes, on the one hand, a Chinese industrious revolution versus a Western industrial revolution, where he sees China as an alternative because the state apparently is not dominated by capitalists. Similarly, Samir Ramin considers China different as a form of state capitalism, uh, particularly focusing on how agriculture, in his view, is not commodified. So the Chinese state represents a potential route, in his view, towards socialism as an alternative to market capitalism. We find these approaches problematic on the basis of their market-based uh, conception of capitalism, which also separates out the political and the economic as well. So we can see this philosophy of external relations pervading not simply mainstream approaches, but competing Marxist approaches as well. We conceive of Chinese integration within the global political economy differently through uneven and combined developmental lines. What this means is a recognition of Chinese development as highly uneven in relation to advanced countries due to its emphasis on cheap labour and low value added activities. This is combined uh, in the contemporary period with advanced industrial countries due to the prominent role of foreign transnational corporations and the general focus on export-led growth. growth. Internally, we also have uneven and combined development as well. This is where Neil Brenner's work is so good at getting to the different scales of uneven and combined development due to the role of cheap labour. Um, workers falling share of GDP and increasing uh, inequality within China. This is combined in a socially uh, uneven way uh, due to uh, the way access to land uh, subsidizes social reproduction, particularly of migrant workers, families in the countryside, delivering uh, cheap food uh, to the urban centers. So the Chinese form of state is embedded within these uneven and combined developmental conditions of global capitalism. We don't see this, though, as uh, reflective of the emergence of China within a transnational form of state, as William Robinson might have it. Nor do we see it as reflected in a rather sort of state-centric view, the Panaching Indian view, uh, the rise of China. Instead, what we perceive as ongoing in, in China since the 1970s in accord with scholars that have picked up on the, the concept of passive revolution, separate from my work on Mexico, and, and have applied it to China, is a case of these ongoing class struggles over passive revolution in China. A passive revolution um, is a condition within which the contradictory elements of both restoration and revolution uh, are, are embedded. Alex Kalinikos really captures it wonderfully in one, one sentence where the change-inducing strains of revolution are partially fulfilled, he argues, 
and displaced, getting to the contradictions. Partial fulfillment of change indu inducing demands, uh, but are also displaced. And we argue in line with other scholars that this is what we see in, in China from the 1970s onwards through the introduction of um, state-owned enterprises, um, an export-led growth strategy from the 1980s onwards, and then the gradual opening up to FDI and the privatization of state-owned enterprises from the 1990s onwards. What we see there is a highly um, class ridden, uh, class conflictual process between different elements of transnational capital versus migrant labor, labor with the re revival of the All China Federation of Trade Unions to mediate such class conflict and the toleration as well as oppression of particular informal labor uh, NGOs. So there is a relative autonomy of the state here. In times of crisis, transnational capital demands reduction in workers' rights while in times of economic recovery, workers reassert themselves. So what we try to do in this chapter is argue that China is not a, a state um, hegemon in conflict uh, with the United States, re replacing one for the other. Um, nor is there actually a process of developmental catch-up, as uh, liberal analyses would have it. Rather, the BRICS has been recognized as, as a discursive mode launched by Gold, Goldman Sachs economists in 2001. And so instead of that emphasis, we argue that there is a complex relationship between a transnational uh, corporate-led restructuring of the global economy through conditions of uneven and combined development, um, which represents the interest of leading capitalists in all countries with, at the same time, actually, the polarization of class conflict uh, within China, which is eliminating the possibility for developmental catching. So where I think, and we think, Samir Amin is, is strong is, is in this short book, The Implosion of Contemporary Capitalism, where he talks about the lock-in of uneven uh, development within, um, within China. So rising powers, so-called rising powers, are not on the uh, capitalist road of catch-up, as the liberals would have it, but are actually embedded in the further polarization of class conflict and the lock-in of uneven development. So that's the chapter that we deal with on uh, China and the, uh, the rising powers, uh, looking at uh, global capitalism through uh, this focus on uneven uh, and combined development. <clears throat> what I want to also talk about is um, the chapter on global war and the new imperialism is a prelude to tomorrow's discussion, and then I'll give a much more detailed presentation on this uh, tomorrow, looking at Iraq. So the question we start with here is, how can the role of geopolitics and capitalism be conceived as internally related through spaces of new imperialism? And here we draw classically on the work of Rosa Luxemburg, as well as contemporaneously um, in interlocution with, with David Harvey, to analyze uneven and combined development through global war as part of the expansion of capitalism. And this sets the stage for us to then again analyze those different class struggles here with particular intra-class uh, fractions within the US form of state in relation to the Iraq war. But again, we do so in departing from some competing Marxist accounts. So we detect, again, this philosophy of external relations in some work. Alex Kalinikos, for example, who examines the external relationship between two logics, a geopolitical logic on the one hand, and he analyzes that predominantly in isolation from a, a capital, capital logic. And we also perceive a, a, a two logics <coughs> approach in Panitch and Gindin's excellent book, um, The Making of Global Capitalism, where, although they might not forcefully separate out these two logics of a, of a capital and a geopolitical logic, they leave the relationship unexplained, uh, which partly, I think, Patrick goes back to some of the frustrations we were talking about in the book earlier. So how does uh, Luxembourg and Harvey help us to overcome um, these separations? 
Well, famously, in a wonderful phrase, um, Rosa Luxemburg, in the accumulation of capital, highlights what she calls militarism as a province uh, of accumulation, <coughs> through which she examines the spatial expansion and reordering uh, of the built environment through imperialism. Um, the Accumulation of Capital is, a, a, again, a wonderful book that we read as part of a reading group um, with graduate students and ended up between eight of us, uh, co-authoring a piece actually, with uh, each of us writing uh, five to six hundred words and then managing to forge some, some commonalities. That, that's a slightly different argument than, than what I want to give today. Though. So this long quote, I think, um, gets to, to, to what Luxembourg delivers in understanding uh, new imperialism. She argues money which capital has set circulating first fulfills its primary function in the exchange with labour power, but subsequently by mediation of the state it begins an entirely new career. As a new purchasing power belonging with neither labour nor capital, it becomes interested in new products, in a special branch of production which does not cater for either the capitalist or the working class, and thus it offers capital new opportunities for creating and realising surplus value. And that's a reference to militarism uh, as this province of, of accumulation. So what we do with that, um, using Luxembourg, is to focus on the geopolitics of militarism uh, that provides a new sphere of, of accumulation. Um, she defines it as an almost automatic regularity of rhythmic uh, growth in which there is a further realisation of, of surplus. We call this the strategy of, of bomb. We're a little bit more blunt than, um, than Rosa Luxemburg, I'm afraid. Uh, equally, uh, what Marx actually and Luxembourg gives us is a focus on fixed capital formation that becomes, again, an essential part of this spatial arrangement and expansion of capitalism through which the absorption of surplus uh, can be maintained. Marx gives us the uh, examples of railroad building, roads, dams, irrigation systems, warehouses, and we can offer more schools, hospitals, universities. This is the strategy of build. So in analysing the new imperialism and issues of the spatial expansion of capitalism through uneven and combined development, we argue that the war in Iraq was actually a combination of bomb and build, um, again, being a bit brutal about it. So processes of bomb and build in the Iraq war were largely conducted through a, a struggle between two particular fractions within the capitalist class in the US state for what we would highlight as a tendency of a largely dominant nationalist class fraction uh, within the US state form that had capital links with defense contractors, um, the oil industries involved in, in reconstruction. And this is what I'll unpack a little bit more uh, tomorrow. And it was this nationalist fraction of capital that shaped and constituted the strategy of bomb and build through those capital links with Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and so on. In the strategy of bomb and build, again through the reconstruction and procurement contracts for the reconstruction of Iraq, the evidence is for us our focus on an internal relationship between militarism and reconstruction to stave off uh, crisis. Now, inevitably, and I think this might happen on Thursday, I was alluding to, to Alan about this, somebody's going to come in and say, well, what about Trump? How do we understand what's emerging now uh, with, with Trump? And uh, we, we uh, hosted Paul Mason, uh, the British journalist, um, who's written this um, very well-received book called Post-Capitalism, where we've worked through the potential meaning of Trumpism. And I had this framework in mind. Um, and I think here, the framework, but also the open-ended nature as to where this might go, uh, is important in relation to Trump. So Steve Bannon in March 2016, <coughs> as you will all know, famously said, we're going to war in the South China Sea. No doubt. It's inevitable. Um, since then, Donald Trump uh, has wiped the share price off Lockheed Martin over the F-35 program, um, slicing some $1.2 billion uh, off its share price by saying that uh, Boeing should price 
out the contracting for, for Lockheed, uh, for the Lockheed F-35 program. And the US Defense Secretary James Mattis is railed against NATO allies for not meeting their mandatory 2% spending of GDP uh, on defense. These are what we would see as markers uh, of a potential nationalist class fraction in struggle with those more transnational elements. And of course, alongside this, TPP has been, been dead in the water. So in relation to Trump, what we would ask is how will militarism as a province of accumulation uh, now proceed within the US form of state? And the answer to that is an easy one. We don't know. Um, that, that has to unfold um, through um, contemporary history. But what we do know, meanwhile, or leading up to this situation, is that under the Obama administration in 2016, and again, as I'm sure you'll know, living in the US, his administration, the Nobel Peace Prize winner of 2009, every 20 minutes dropped a bomb um, on Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, Somalia, uh, and Pakistan. So militarism is significant as a province of accumulation, realizing surplus value through this bomb strategy while offering through reconstruction a build element, at least in Iraq, um, for, for a, a small window, uh, providing fresh room for accumulation for some. Okay, we'll get into the details of that hopefully uh, a little bit more tomorrow um, to wrap up. So we have this triumvirate focus on global capitalism, global war, global crisis. These are the empirical chapters that um, we offer as a vantage point on our structuring focus on uneven and combined development and various class strategies um, embedded within uneven and combined development. The way global capitalism generates contradictions of crisis, challenging the profitability as well as uh, its own legitimacy, uh, is in turn marked by conditions of global war uh, to revive, or at least attempt to revive, profitability to give a new spatial fix, as Harvey would call it, to capital in the reassertion of imperialist rule. David Harvey, in a 1975 essay, captures this wonderfully, we think, by stressing that capitalist development has to negotiate a knife-edge path between preserving the values of past capital, investments in the built environment, and destroying those investments in order to open up fresh room for accumulation. And that's what he and we think is ongoing through uh, the new imperialism. We therefore think posing the question uh, as to whether we are witnessing an era of bomb and build, but also resistances to that process, set against the continued expansion of uneven and combined development on a world scale is happening. And that's our conclusion. That actually in the era of the new imperialism, we're seeing both these strategies of bomb and build as part of the spatial expansion of uneven and combined development in new ways, but also in ways that echo the sorts of processes that Luxembourg looked at when she was tackling the province of militarism uh, as a form of accumulation within her time. On that note, I will conclude. This is just to save me flicking through all of the slides to get back to the structure of the book. So I'll leave it on that note. Thank you. So we have a half hour to begin the discussion now. I think the floor is just open for anyone who wants to jump in. I was, uh, if you could just give me your name, you sorry, again. Huh? Your name, sorry, again. Jamal Rogers. I was curious about you putting um, China in the slides, and uh, I know there's been some discussion among folks in the circle of our travel in about whether or not this is some kind of imperialist penetration of Africa mm. based on what they've been doing over the last decade or so. So I just wanted to know what your opinion of that was. Yeah, we don't. Um we don't talk too much about Chinese foreign direct investment in sub-Saharan Africa um, <clears throat> in, in the chapter, although it is a, it is a topic of teaching, and um, there's the, it's probably got a little bit dated now, but there's the documentary that I use in teaching, which is uh, When China Met Africa, which is quite a useful 
capturing of those processes, uh, both in terms of Chinese capital, but also the kind of cultural clashes that that entails within Sub-Saharan Africa. It's made by the same documentary filmmakers as uh, Black Gold that I referenced earlier. I think Black Gold is better, but that's a different, different story. That's about coffee. Um, so I think there is, I think there is a case to be made <coughs> about seeing Chinese foreign direct investment, which is specifically targeted at forms of the exploitation of cheap labor and also um, investment in the built environment uh, through, through those policies. I think that case can be made. Um, what, I, what I perhaps would, and that's where I would like to leave the analysis, what I would want to avoid is the notion that um, China is an inherently state uh, state-led, aggressive um, opponent to the U.S. Again, understood through that, that, that clash of state interests. Um, but I think, in terms of FDI and the exploitation of cheap labour, China can be can be seen as a as an imperialist presence within Sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, please. Uh, just to, your name again. Sorry. My name is Matt. Yep. Uh, I wanted to hear about the material structure of ideology. Yep. Um, what for you is ideology? How does it grow and develop? Okay, that's a, a trickier question. Uh, um, how does it grow and develop? Um, on the material structure of ideology, what what I've done with that, not in this book, but in, the, in a paper I've just shared with, with, with Patrick, is, um, is use those insights from Gramsci uh, on his understanding of the material structure of ideology and situate that with Henri Lefebvre's focus on the built environment and the organisation of space, the production of space, to understand the role and the, the, this very specific role that certain civic monuments can play within everyday life, within civil society. So, uh, um, I, and I use those theoretical sites in a highly empirical way to actually read one monument within Mexico. Um, as part of a ongoing struggle over the production of space, um, and how that uh, the, the focus is the monument to the revolution in Mexico City, and how that particular project actually grew out of the the Diaz um, dictatorship, the Antion regime, Antiguo Viejo, and was then part of the post-revolutionary state, and was a state-led project, but then entered into different contestations, of social movements, post-68 um, uh, crisis, processes of resistance, and now has become the focus for the privatization of public space. The monument underwent re renovations in 2010 for the centenary of the revolution, the bicentenary of independence, and the concession that the state gave was to a private company to run you know, the main uh, tourist attractions at that site. So that's how I would conceive of the, the material structure of ideology through the built environment, literally through a concrete uh, manifestation. How does ideology grow and develop? I think it has to be then fumbling through that more difficult part of your question or fumbling towards that more difficult part of the question. It has to be an empirical question. Um, so ideology <coughs> through that particular case can be seen to grow and develop in terms of a post-revolutionary construction and formation of the modern Mexican state and what the revolution was meant to mean. And one of the beautiful contradictions of that monument is that the so-called heroes, whether it was um, Francisco Pancho Villa, uh, Carranza, um, Obregón, or um, Cárdenas, they're all buried in the monument. They're all interned there. Um, so that growth and formation of ideology changes has changed with the particular social function and social purpose that that monument is put to. Um, so I think it has to be an empirical and a historical uh, question. Uh, I don't think we can answer growth of ideology in the, in the abstract. But just to answer the very first part of Matt's, what yeah. is ideology that is growing or developing? What's ideology itself? Because you talk more about the material structure of it than okay. about the it. Well, I would say, I'll come back to having to analyze it through particular class processes. So the projection of um, 
on the one hand class dominance um, and then on the other hand how that is a class driven struggle uh, against those dominant ideas. So, so it's I, but it's ideas. I mean, that's the thing. Is, well, is the, is the thing that is class the struggle is over or yeah. projected or has a material structure. I think ideas. I think one has to be a bit careful there with Gramsci. Um, I have to be a bit careful there with Gramsci because the ideational can be elevated. You know, particularly when Gramsci talks about um, ideas. What about, what about your view, Regard, <laughs> regardless of... Yeah, there's a, there has to be a material, there are material, there's a materiality to it as well. Um, so, those, the projection of those ideas isn't simply a discourse about nationalism, uh, about nationhood. Um, there are particular policies, material policies behind those ideas, which are co-constituted. Um, so, for example, to come back to the monument, um, the projection of a post-revolutionary state went hand in hand with the trappings of import substitution industrialization. Um, the projection of ideology through that monument now is primarily about um, the valorization of uh, consumption, uh, tourism uh, through, through the monument. Um, so there are material processes and policies behind and allied with those ideas. But just to get the concepts squared here, and this is particularly relevant to your very strong claims about internal relations, yes. to say it's behind or projected on still implies that the ideology itself is about the ideas which are internally connected to these policies and whatever. Yeah. But the policies themselves are not the ideology. The ideology are, are the ideas that are connected to the policy. And exist independent of material. Well, they're just, you can, you can talk about the content of the ideology and its internal relation to policies. Yeah. Without the policies, you wouldn't get that ideology. Without the ideology, you wouldn't have those policies. They're necessarily connected. And still say that the term ideology is referring to the ideas. Yeah. As opposed to the term ideology covers everything. Yeah. I mean, there's this problem with internal, with the, internal relations stuff that it can lead to everything getting mushed together. Yeah. You know, that internal relations just becomes everything mushed togetherism. Yeah. And if it's not, then it does seem like you're actually providing, s there are also some separateness in spite of the internal relations. Yeah. Because something is the relata of those internal relations and ideology. So when you say the material structure of ideology, it implies that there is <laughs> a material face of this relation but it's the structure of something, and the yeah. something is ideology in this case. Yeah, but I, I, I thought this would come up, because we've touched on this before, but that, that material structure of something is, I would see as class, class conditioning of those ideas. But it's of ideas. Still. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so the ideology part of it, the specificity of why we're talking about that is the ideas mm -hmm. side of all of this stuff. Yeah, but you can't... You can't discuss the ideas side without the material content of class. So that's where I see well, the internal relationship at work. And I wouldn't stress that those ideas are, in, are independent or autonomous. No. Um, it's one thing to say you can't analyze it independently because of the necessary internal relation, and another thing is that you can't even talk about it. Yeah. That is, when you talk about the ideas, you talk about the ideas, even though the analysis of the ideas can't be done independently. Yeah. And I don't see how you can talk about them without talking about them. I mean, yeah. that is, you can't in one, in, in one mouthful simultaneously talk about the material policies without which these ideas wouldn't be sustained and, and talk about the ideas. So the sentence structure has still, uh, you're still talking about the ideas as such. When yeah, you, yeah. But Surely, just to try and run with this now, surely then Gramsci's notion of the organic intellectual gives you both at the same time. So the way in which Gramsci himself analysed uh, specific organic, organic intellectuals, uh, Benedetto Croce, for example, the champion of philosophical idealism, but also situated Croce in relationship to the materiality of the state. Well, that's how you explain why 
those kinds of ideas get produced by that kind of person. They're an organic intellectual. Yeah. So that's part of the analysis for sure. Yeah. But you still discuss his treatise and go through the logic of the ideas and, and the concepts and whatever. Yeah. Which implies that they are both separate and internally related. I mean, the rejection of the separateness of things that are internally related is the part that I just don't understand. Yeah. We've, we've had this conversation yeah, we before. Have, yeah. We never resolved it. You know, I just don't, I don't get it. I get internal relations as opposed to external relations, but yeah. I don't get the claim that once you acknowledge internal relations, you can't talk about the things that are related. You can't talk about the relata of those internal relations at, on their own terms. You, you, know. can, you can talk about them as related, but I think Sayer is pretty bold here and, and, and clear in saying that that relationship is, is one of an inner connection, not yeah. an interaction. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that's how I would understand the role of the organic intellectual uh, situated within, you know, within the, the material structure of ideology. I think Alan wants to come in. Uh, Alan is. Sorry, not on this, okay. Yeah, that's right, we can, we can, I mean, this also, this is a, I mean, I have more questions about that particular issue that I, yeah. I'd like to raise, but. And I think it can, can come can, through in very many different ways, so I think it, we, we'll come back to it. Um, yeah, I, I want to ask a, a, a basic question. What do you mean when you talk about uneven and combined development? Yeah. That is, I know it as, as this basically political category, that is, yes. Yeah you know, coming from, you know, Helfand to Trotsky and yeah. beyond uh, as a way of understanding yeah. class conflict, as a way of understanding the contradictions in various classes. Yeah. So, um, and since it's so central to your discussion here, I'm wondering how you're using it. We're definitely drawing from Trotsky uh, in those earlier chapters. So the way in which he would talk about the peculiarities of Russian historical development from his history of the Russian Revolution, the peculiarities of his Russian historical development um, in relation to the expansion of capitalism. So we have an uneven development in terms of different social property relations for, for simple um, purposes, you know, feudalism in, in Russia, that um, is then driven through the whip of external necessity, as he would call it, to try and play that catch-up game with capitalism, and throws up its own contradictions of class struggle in the combination of those property relations of capitalism and feudalism, which for Trotsky generated the sparks of the, the Russian Revolution. So uneven and combined development um, sometimes gets called co combined and uneven development, but Trotsky's causally quite clear on the relationship that you have this, the unevenness of development uh, through the expansion of capitalism that then combines different property relations which generates those class conditions you mentioned. But then of course is the, the key ingredient being imperialism. Yeah. That is the entry of, as the Russian example, uh, French or Brit uh, capital, capital yeah. uh, in particular sectors. Yeah. Uh, causing immense dislocations uh, and so on. And uh, so, of course, I'm, I'm very interested to hear where you go with this in, in your discussion of Iraq. Yeah. Well, we'll have more on that tomorrow. Uh, not, not, not to say that all issues will be resolved, <coughs> um, but I think what we touch on is the struggle over the so called global oil spigot. You know, Harvey's famous phrase from the new imperialism. And we actually say that the Iraq wasn't simply about that. It's, it's actually more complex. Um, so there is a focus on the global expansion of uneven and combined development in relation to the new imperialism, but it's not simply a struggle over oil. Yeah. So hopefully we'll get into that tomorrow. Yeah. Sure. I'm curious, I mean, I, I, this didn't occur to me until the latter part of the, the talk. Just, um, would this analysis, analysis help to explain the New Deal in the United States? Wow. The, the bomb and the build dimension to it. But also I'm wondering to what degree is the concept of passive revolution helpful in understanding the New Deal to any degree? Um, rupture and restoration. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about that? 
No. Um, getting myself into an interesting sort of territory with passive revolution as a concept, because I've worked on it so heavily, both theoretically and empirically in relation to Mexico, I'd always be able to say, well, look, you know, this is a historically specific argument about the Mexican Revolution, its own historical peculiarities, and the contradictions, the uneven and combined development, um, threw up is probably the wrong word, but exposed. Um, and, you know, the debate has trundled along um, to the degree now that various people are using the concept, which is fine, uh, including in relation to China. And you find yourself starting to then widen, widen the prism. Um, the problem that with that, which Alex Kalinikos is rightly highlighted in a special issue of Kaplan Class, um, is that you overextend Gramsci's concept. Um, and Kalinikos rather cleverly, so even though I, I sort of critique the piece in, in a response, he cleverly also asserts that Gramsci actually overextended his own concept. So the, the original passive revolution for Gramsci was not simply the Italian Risorgimento, it was also the expansion of capitalism through Americanism and Fordism. So this might you know, begin to address the, the, the New Deal uh, dimension, potentially as a, as a positive but also a negative, because Kalinikos sees problems with the way in which Gramsci overextended his own concept to the degree that Gramsci then also thinks of fascism as a, as a form of passive uh, revolution. So maybe you could look at, I'm going to run with the idea, maybe you could look at the New Deal as a form of passive revolution and, and Trumpism as its ugly, ugly variant, I don't know. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that, um, mainly because you'd have to conduct the, the hard research, as Gramsci would call it, to produce uh, integral history in order to um, see whether those concepts would have purchase on the history. And I haven't got those, those skills about and knowledge about the New Deal. What, what you could do, though, is um, certainly think about the way in which the New Deal promoted those processes of reconstruction in the built environment to absorb the surplus population, um, to uh, enable um, the absorption of surplus value through the, the kind of geographical uh, dimensions that Harvey gives you about the expansion of capital. Um, so I think you could, you could certainly do that. Whether that could then be embedded within passive revolution as a concept, which Harvey does talk about at certain stages within the new imperialism, I think is a, is a different matter. It's not one that I would feel comfortable doing myself. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've never, I, I like the concept, but not so much the label passive yeah. revolution because it's, it's far from passive. Yeah. It requires an extremely clever and active state strategy. Yeah. And it makes it, you know, it, until you real until you really understand the underlying argument, I mean, and even then you just accept the label because that's the label. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the word the revolution part of the couplet, Gramsci was using yeah. because he saw this as something that prevents an actual revolution. That yeah. it, it occurs in a context where a full bore revolution could have otherwise occurred. There's a kind of counterfactual. Yeah. He's not saying that the historical agency was there to actually accomplish it, but it was a it was an historical possibility. Yeah. In the 21st century, when we look back at that period and we look at what happened in the actual revolutions and how none of them accomplished, you know, a the development towards a, a democratic working class empowered transformative project. So yeah. they all failed with respect to that what was thought of at the in Gramsci's time as a real revolutionary possibility. Yeah. Uh, it makes the term again even less, in my judgment, informative as in terms of its label. Yeah. Uh, and that some other conceptual framing of the problem, I think, would be better. Yeah. It's really talking about a form of successful incorporating reformism. Yeah. Uh, whether or not it was in the face of an otherwise revolution. Right. So in the American New Deal, I think what you have is 
what I like to call a positive class compromise, which mm -hmm. does stabilize the system. It helps solve problems within the contradictions of capital and meets some of the needs of dominated groups uh, and establishes the conditions for a hegemonic, yeah. stabilized rule. It does all that. And that's really the substance of the argument of passive revolution, that that's accomplished you know, through various means. Yeah. And neither the word passive nor the word, word revolution is all that helpful. Yeah. You know, in, in, in the contemporary discussions, if we're applying this to the world today. Gramsci does give you some, some means to address that problem, though, in, in two ways, I think. One, he talks about the, the politics of transformismo, so uh, transformationism. Um, and he, he, he relates transformismo as a, as a, which basically is a pro, set of class processes to absorb opposition, to dilute and co-opt and absorb opposition. And I think the ameliorative consequences of the New Deal could be seen as, sure, as part yeah. of that, that, that process. So he gives you, you know, through transformismo and his critique of it, he gives you the means to, to address that without having to take recourse to passive revolution. But then he also talks about processes, and I can't quite remember the, the right phrasing of it now, but he also talks about processes where there's a pure restoration of, of class rule without a partial addressing of the, of the demands of, of working class compromise. Um, and he talks about this, you know, through uh, this notion of just a pure restoration. Right. Um, so I think there, there is a bit more um, conceptual armory there that Gramsci can give us. Um, yeah, I would, I would feel a bit, a bit uncomfortable about the New Deal. Um, but you can definitely see it's the politics of transformismo, which importantly sets up conditions of hegemony. Right. Yeah. Um, Mark Rupert's book actually, um, pre um, producing, I think it's called Producing Hegemony, is very good on this as well. I think it's quite a path-breaking book. Jamala. Yeah, when you talk about class struggle, are you using it in the classic Marxist sense, or are you using it in a more contemporary way? Have you analyzed the class analysis that expands that traditional uh, definition? And if so, who do you see in these classes? The, um, the chapter under construction at the moment, chapter four, um, no, sorry, chapter six. Andreas always chides me for getting the order of the chapters wrong. Chapter six is where we relate class struggle in that classical conception, conception to struggles within the workplace. Um, but we also engage with those debates, and I haven't come in on the chapter yet, um, but I've seen Andreas's draft uh, about the social factory, struggles over social reproduction, um, struggles over the exploitation of the biosphere as widening the framework of class struggle. And so this is where we think that there necessarily has to be a, a move away simply from struggles within the workplace to engage with these broader vectors. Um, so I think that, that addresses the question. Um, so it's not simply struggles within the workplace. You know, oh, sorry. Yeah, I, when you were characterizing China's trajectory of yeah. development, um, you, know, you, you didn't want to say that they were catching up with the center, uh, but despite their growth, they were reinforcing or locking in. Uh, yeah, uneven development. Yeah. I was wondering, how, how would you characterize the trajectories of, of countries like uh, South Korea or Taiwan? And, and is that, you know, you see like a, a quality of difference from, from their past, of their past from uh, that of China? Um, yeah, different pathways to development, to go back to earlier discussions. Yeah, so yes would be the easy answer. There, there, there is a different pathway there. It's certainly not a state capitalist pathway that China's followed, but it is a state capitalist pathway of a different kind. Um, do you get both catch up and lock in? Yes. Um, you know, you can point to indices. Even in relation to China, you can point to indices where there is, you know, some forms of developmental catch-up. Does that um, 
does that entail therefore then a process of um, of even development no because that can never be reached um, does that absolve the notion of you know, inherent and very strong and vibrant conditions of class struggle no because that's clearly evident within South Korea for example uh, that Taiwan, Indonesia, those states as well. So I think those contradictions, even if you can point to the indices of developmental catch-up for in some instances and, and, and for some interests, there is that contradiction of a crisis and struggle as well, where there is the further locking. So you get, I think you get both tendencies, both contradictions at the same time. But the pathway to development is different, I think, in those countries as well. Yeah, yeah, building off that a little bit, I just wanted you to elucidate a little more in your comment. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that China is not um, state hegemonic in opposition to the U.S. or in convergence. Yeah. Because in my own personal understanding, I kind of have garnished that it is kind of trying to be the rising hegemon of the East and maybe perhaps of the world. And a lot of their political strategies that they have pursued mm. or are continuing to pursue mimic that of the U.S. in their own unique way. Um, to some extent, their intervention in Africa and the Middle East, or their um, free trade agreement with the Association of East Asian countries, similar to that of NATO, mm. or you could say the power of um, the foothold in, of the South China Sea in yeah. relation to the way that the um, Panama Canal and the economic opportunities open for the U.S. So, again, I kind of see a lot of their political strategies as mimicking the U.S. and perhaps uh, trying to make them the hegemonic power of the East. Yeah, we've got. Um, I can't remember the stats now, but we've got some some stats in the in that chapter, where you know, very simple, crude comparison of um, U.S. GDP spending on military, um, you know, infrastructure compared to China, and, and the U.S. still dominates. I think it's the next seven combined, you know, and that includes China within that. So even with all of those factors you've mentioned. The notion that there is a state-to-state -state competition there is, 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 is you know, of, of, of catch-up on the military side of things is, is an awkward one, I think. Um, <clears throat> equally, I mean, if, if China can depose, and I think there are debates on this that it is thinking of doing so, the role of the US dollar as quasi-world money, then all bets are off. Um, but with the US retaining that particular privilege of the US dollar as quasi-world money, I think the political and the economic circumstances of the rise of China still leads it to be um, in a position where it's a member of a, uh, an interdependent transnational set of interests rather than a dominant hegemon. Um, so I think it depends how you define hegemony as well. But even if one looks at the military spending, particularly in terms of the political economy, at the moment China's not there. Uh, doesn't mean to say it couldn't be. Um, so I think a lot depends on the role of the, the dollar as quasi world money. So, I mean, it's one thing to talk <coughs> about whether it's going to catch up on the military, that specific dimension of yeah. global power, but and, and another to ask whether Chinese capitalism as a site of capital accumulation and as a force for global capital accumulation mm. won't catch up uh, with the most advanced sectors of the world. Yeah. And if, if you think of China as, after all, a quarter of the world's population, uh, and that um, if you just look at the global cities of China, yeah. they're already global cities. I mean, that. If, if the United States and Mexico and Central America were one country, so that our uneven developed, you know, peasant infer, uh, hinterland was part of the country rather than with a national border, yeah. and China kind of mimicked that for a long time with its past system. It yeah. sort of made its own hinterland a different country in a way. You know, so the I think in terms of catch up on the technological frontiers and the capital accumulation frontiers, I don't see any reason why on that dimension they won't be a full player. Yeah. And then they just made 
like uh, Europe be sensible and decide to let the United States bankrupt itself with its <laughs> over. Yeah, that could be possible. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's just stupid to be spending what we're spending. Yeah. Military, from, from some points of view, yeah. not from the point of view of the military industrial complex. For sure. But one of the interesting, and it's, it keeps seesawing, so it depends when one takes a slice through time. One of the interesting developments is that you know, labor within Mexico now is cheaper than in China. Um, so labor, labor in China itself is becoming more right. expensive. Yeah, well, that's a sign of catch up, too. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but you've got huge disparities, rural, urban yeah. migration and um, inequality there as well. Right. Um, and it's those millions that are migrating where you know, tensions and, again, conflict-driven circumstances will be inherent, I think. Um, so, you know, it is a wait and see. Yeah. Um,